Hi, everyone. Thank you again uh, for uh, being here with us. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce to you all Vitalik Buterin. Uh, thank you, Vitalik, for joining us here for this fireside chat. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. Yeah. So we first met in 2015 in San Francisco on your original roadshow for the Ethereum ICO. And I was really impressed by the vision for the Ethereum ecosystem. And it's one of my greatest regrets in life, not having jumped in with a small bit of investment that day. Um, I admit I was completely daunted by the prospect of what you were building, and I didn't think it was possible. Um, so when we met a year later in Shanghai, it was clear that I was mostly wrong. And in my new role at Hyperledger, I was intent on making sure that we didn't second guess this community being built, even while Hyperledger was set to really explore the more permission side of the blockchain space. These days, I like to think that while we're more full spectrum at Hyperledger with Hyperledger Bezu and other efforts that bridge these two worlds, um, you know, so what we're here to do is talk about the future of Ethereum and how it relates to this thing called the enterprise. Uh, but I want to start on these early days. So let me ask, even before Ethereum kicked off, you participated in the early days of, in the development of the Bitcoin ecosystem and the Bitcoin code base. What was it about those early days of that, that open source community around Bitcoin that made it so accessible to, to a young Vitalik? And I think one of the fascinating things about the Bitcoin community early on is just how it managed to attract and bring together like many very different kinds of people, right? Because in, like crypto as a whole is itself a very multidisciplinary thing, right? You have the cryptography, you have the math, you have the economics, you have the monetary theory, you have the social and political um, implications, um, you have uh, businesses trying to do things with it. And there are definitely many different people, like even back in the, the community in 2011, that just came at it from all of these different perspectives. Right. And, you know, sometimes the perspectives are very different and, you know, there is even some uh, uh, healthy and vigorous uh, debate on the uh, Bitcoin forums uh, the, back in 2011. This was, you know, back before they were even called Bitcoin Talk. And, you know, I was interested in a lot of things at the time, like I've always been interested in math. I've uh, been, been interested in cryptography. I was uh, interested in economics as well. Also, you know, interested in, I guess, the bigger questions of uh, life and uh, human civilization. Uh, so like, the Bitcoin community definitely had uh, kind of some of all of that. And it was just uh, a great forum to just talk with other people that had all of these uh, different and interesting ideas. And then also there was, just, there was this just vibrant community of uh, people that was just, you know, willing to come in and help and uh, like build whatever needed to be built, right? Like, you know, we needed to build um, a Bitcoin client and there was this community of core developers that was working on and improving the client. Uh, we needed to uh, build Bitcoin wallets. People came in and just made wallets and you know you needed um, a way for people to see what's going on in the blockchain. People just came in and built block explorers. So there was this great uh, kind of community collaborative feeling there at the time, which uh, I definitely really like. And that's definitely one of the things that I uh, definitely yeah. really value and kind of care about really trying to support in Ethereum as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes when us in the when we in the open source community talk about um, the about the community and about how things work, we can sometimes sometimes I, I'm guilty of making it sound like spontaneous combustion. <laughs> you know, like these things just happened and we didn't know why or how. Um, but when you think about the the Ethereum ecosystem now and like the role that the foundation is playing and 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 others, are there specific things like you think about or or that they think about in terms of helping foster the the right kind of uh, community around, especially the the, the development the open source community around the development of, of Ethereum? Mm, I mean, I think uh, having a yeah, good open source community definitely, kind of, like there, there's a lot of different ingredients that I think uh, you need to get right. I, like one of them is um, just that like the, the ecosystem needs to be one that's kind of open and welcoming and like if someone wants to come in and contribute, they yeah, actually can go do that. Um, like it's definitely easy to just even accidentally fail at that and like ac accidentally just you know end up either driving away contributors when you don't need to or just like not making it clear that there's things where people just like can go in and participate. Um, also, I, I think Ethereum has been kind of successful just because of what it is, right? Like it's not a yeah, 
uh, a kind of you know finite bounded system in the sense of just you know here's one thing that you can do with it and like you know this is money or this is a domain name system or like this is one thing um it's an open platform and people can just uh, you know go and do and like build their own like interesting and amazing things and just like having that space is um also i think important for having an ecosystem that developers are excited about yeah. um also i mean i think there's just like you do have to get the get the economics right like and this is one of the challenges of this uh, community is right like especially with crypto that like on the one hand um well, well, like, I think, like, the biggest difference, I think, between, uh, like, crypto projects and the ecosystem and, say, the open source ecosystem of, um, you know, the early 2000s is that, like, there's money involved. And there is, like, a significant amount of money for, kind of, of floating around. You know, you got the coins, and the coins go up, and then the coins go down, and then, uh, and then there's new coins, and then there's new coins going up and down. Uh, and on the one hand, like, this means that you actually have an opportunity to like try to even pay people like compensate people who are doing really important work um which you know i think is important right like you can rely on volunteers for some things you can rely on volunteers for smaller projects but i mean the the challenge with a kind of just relying on volunteers instead of going forever is that like first of all you know you're not going to necessarily attract enough people and also like if you have this ecosystem where like some people are contributing for free but then other people are making millions off of it like that just feels very unfair to people right and like that is a legitimate challenge of uh, the, the crypto space as well right that like sometimes you do have this imbalance and like you make this one valuable tool and like okay maybe you can get a grant but then you make this uh, other thing where like you you've come up with a way to stick a coin in the middle of it and uh you know, you get like $25 million of VC investment flying at you. And like, that's an imbalance. And, and we've definitely like tried to do our best to address that imbalance. And like, at the same time as, um, you know, trying to prevent like the, the Ethereum foundation itself from sort of being an overly dominant pull in the ecosystem. So that's also a challenge. Um, another important challenge is just like, appealing to the uh, kind of diverse community like you know not everyone that might want to contribute speaks english that's probably the most obvious example and like just making you know our contents documentation everything is like accessible and in um, a different language is trying to actually engage with all of the local communities is something that we've valued and really tried to do for a long time as well Cool. Well, yeah, so many different pressures at play, and and compared to like the idyllic early days of, of Apache or Linux or something like that, it sometimes feels like these pressures can really create such a such an intense kind of pressure cooker environment. Um, uh, with some of those pressures increasingly uh, feel like they might be coming from people trying to adopt these technologies for enterprise uses. You know, I think of the enterprise, I think of Star Trek or whatever as kind of this almost you know uh, impossibly big or menacing thing. But uh, but really, some of these are for very prosaic use cases, right? For settlement systems for for um, regulatory reporting or auditing that sort of thing how much are those pressures on the backs of the uh, core ethereum developers how much are you thinking about this you know especially with the design for ethereum 2 uh, uh, were these kinds of use cases and needing to support those use cases on your minds as you were you were designing the f2 uh, design yeah, and I think like enterprise users of blockchains are definitely really important, uh, and and I think like the big the biggest way in which um, ETH two in particular can help enterprises is just having more scalability, right? That's because uh, you know right now transaction fees are high, and one of the challenges with uh, transaction fees being high is that like first of all it just prices out users, but like it prices out different kinds of users differently, right? Like it. I think the people who get priced out first often are just like, you know, the people that wants to use the blockchain for like doing based like non-financial things, like whether it's, you know, supply chain tracking or even things like ENS or like just about everything that's not moving high value crypto tokens around. And so when the fees go up to $10, like, you know, all that's left is like, well, there's some high value domains and then there's like a lot of moving crypto tokens around. And 
our vision in Ethereum has always been to be this platform that's open to all of these different um, applications where, you know, the limit is just your creativity. But if in practice, just the economics make it so it's only viable to do a few things, then in some ways that's like a big limitation on how much of our mission we can actually accomplish. So you know, the, the dream of scalability, right, is, you know, we have rollups and rollups already exist for some applications and now general purpose rollups are coming very soon, right? Like uh, Arbitrum recently yeah, released their uh, th uh, thing on uh, mainnet and then Optimism has a yeah, kind of limited uh, rollout on mainnet that they've been slowly expanding over time. ZK Sync has been making uh, great progress. Right. Um, and at the same time, we've been working on sharding, which kind of improves the base layer itself so that um, at the base layer, you have something like 100 times more scalability. Right. So sharding times 100, roll up times 100, the two multiply times 10,000. And like the hope is that you can simultaneously like make the, pl the platform able to handle more users and like reduce transaction fees. Right. And so yeah. you know, you, it's like supply and demand. Right. You have like, more supply. And so, you know, you don't have like all of the, these users kind of bidding against each other so hard. So if transaction fees can go down, then, mm -hmm. you know, we're hoping by a, a factor of a, a of hundred, but we'll see. Um, and then that like opens the door for all of these other applications again. And like, yeah. there are a lot of people, you know, even in enterprise that even wants to use the public chain, right? Like there's, mm -hmm. you know, like EY and like the, the nightfall, I think it was, there's like the baseline protocol, there's, all of these amazing groups trying to like do a public chain based um, enterprise things. And again, I yeah, like, I definitely believe in kind of the public chain, I guess, because like, I don't even like want to see a future where, you know, like enterprise and kind of, you know, the people have to be these kind of two different poles that are like, you know, are either different universes or kind of viewed as opposing each other. Like, you know, we should have an ecosystem where, you know, the enterprises and everyone, they can just all live together and uh, you know, the, the ecosystems can kind of plug into each other and benefit each other much more. And, and the, but the challenge is that, you know, if you want anyone to be building on the public chain, then, you know, the transaction fees have to go down and then also privacy issues have to be solved. And, and that's like the other benefit, right? Like you have all of these like very diverse, different groups, like just building and working on this technology and like everyone can just use each other's stuff, ideally. Right. Um, so I'm, so I'm optimistic about that future. Good. good. And you mean it isn't as easy as just increasing the block size by 10 X? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Elon said it was, so I thought that I thought that was that that was that was the case. Um, and obviously, one of the big changes coming up in Ethereum too is the move from proof of work to proof of stake, which um, you know a lot of people are concerned about the energy consumption of uh, of main of, of cryptocurrencies in general. Um, uh, you, you know, how much was uh, the environmental concerns on your mind as you were designing two O? Uh, is the move largely driven by that, or were there were there other motivations? Mm. And I, th and I think it was def it's definitely a major reason why people want to move over. Um, I think, like the the consequences of um, you know the amount of like energy and even just stuff that proof of work systems consume are pretty significant, right? Like, and people like often talk about you know the energy waste aspect, but then there's also uh, like first of all, you know, even if you're using amazing solar power, like, you know, you're still which you know there's not everyone else like you're still taking away energy that could be used by other people and like you know we've seen like in iran the the government's been angry because of like electricity being displaced from local villages and so forth and then there's hardware and hardware has its own environmental costs uh, so going from that to a yeah, consensus model where the, the economics are fully virtualized, which is, you know, what proof of stake is, right? Like we've even talked about like proof of stake validators as being kind of like virtual miners, right? Um, I, you know, they're like miners, except, uh, you know, it's all kind of digital and just simulated by the system. And, and uh, that just like completely solves all of these problems. So, you know, we don't even have to argue about them and we don't have to just like get into these lengthy debates of like, you know, who's using coal and who's using solar and like, is the solar actually solar and all of this stuff. Like, no, just like make a yeah, system where, you know, the, the resource can, requirements as a whole are just more than a thousand times lower. Like that's definitely, a bit, I think it's definitely a big, um, a big motivation for us. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, of course, at the same time, there is uh, kind of the more selfish factor, which is that if you uh, reduce, like, the fact that you need so much um, electricity and, like, 
hardware, like you also need to pay for that stuff. And to pay for that stuff, you just have to like print a huge number of coins. And that, like, you know, it does risk the, the, the economic sustainability of the system of kind of the, you have to choose between, you know, either the supply of coins just kind of continuing to go up nonstop or between potentially risking um, security going down to very low levels. And like, once again, you know, the proof sake, we don't have that trade off. Uh, so I think, you know, it's uh, good for the good for the Ethereum community, good for the users, good for the world. Um, yeah. It's uh, always great when things line up that way. Yeah, that's great. And um, just a, a, as a wrap-up question, what's, what is the one technology you think uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem as a whole that you're most excited about when it uh, when you think about the needs of enterprises or the needs of getting this uh, kind of infrastructure adopted by, by the mainstream of society? What kind of infrastructure? Um, I think... Uh, like some of the, the higher level stuff that I'm most concerned about. So I think like we've talked about privacy uh, and I, and I've talked about it a lot previously as well. And it's definitely important, right? Like, you know, you don't want uh, you know, Twitter for your bank account, right? Um, and uh, like the nice thing about like combining blockchains and cryptography is that you have a lot of room to just like make all of these like different compromises between them, you know, privacy and what your other goals are. And you can kind of much more freely define like what it is you're actually getting. And at the same time, you know, the blockchain has this verifiability and auditability. So, you know, if you like need, uh, like if you want need, like well, whether for an audit or investigation or something like prove that, you know, here's things that happened before and like, look, I did every, I, I did everything the way I was supposed to be doing, like you, you, you can, and you can just kind of selectively reveal whatever information you want. Right. Like, so there's a great future for uh, improving privacy. Um, security, I think, is also important, right? Like, uh, I yeah, still remember and uh, frequently link back to the uh, Bitcoin Magazine article I wrote in 2013. This was like a Bitcoin wallet security. Uh, and uh, there were these uh, kind of nightmare stories of, uh, you know, a guy has a half a million dollars of Bitcoin and then he wakes up and then he doesn't have half a million dollars of Bitcoin. What happens? I don't think we know yet. Uh, but, you know, there's, you can hack someone's computer, someone's computer can get lost. Um, if you write the words down on a piece of paper, someone can steal the piece of paper, the piece of paper can get lost. Um, you know, there's just all of these things that can happen. And like, I've talked about ideas, like I've talked about things like multi-sig wallets and social recovery wallets and all of these things to try to like reduce the, the risk that things like that happen and like actually make like cryptographic keys or at least kind of blockchain wallets a more viable way of like authenticating a person. Um, but, you know, it's, this is, you know, like, I feel like we've seen a like, fairly big improvements over the last uh, three years as well, uh, right? And I feel like, you know, we're going to continue to see improvements in the future. So, you know, once again, like, it's both, like, for me, a big concern and a worry, but it's also something that I'm like, very excited about see, uh, it, seeing fixed, because I know it is going to be fixed. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vitalik. I mean, I, I'm reminded of the quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, which is, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And I see this pattern repeat, whether it's the early days of the internet, people were concerned, we can't use it for commercial purposes because it's this research thing and it's unreliable. Um, then they said that about open source software, I, I, you know, and, the, and there's that transition point in like the late 90s where it was like, okay, maybe we can use this for enterprises. Um, and I think that's a similar transition point we're at when it comes to thinking about the full spectrum of blockchain technologies. And I think the Ethereum ecosystem is playing a key role in that, in that transition. So thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to talking with you again soon. No, thank you, Brian. And thank you for just all the great work you've been doing with Hyper Leisure. Very sweet. Thanks.